Welcome to Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree, where we talk about gospel insights through great stories and help you find entertainment that's both true and beautiful. Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree is part of the Public Square Media Network of podcasts that seek to bring an LDS perspective into the public square. I'm your host, Liz Busby. I am a writer of science fiction and fantasy, an English graduate student at BYU, a reviewer of books, and a Latter-day Saint. And with me today is my co-host, Carl. Hello, everyone. I'm Carl Cranny. I have a PhD in religion, and I have written on the intersection of religious themes in pop culture. And we have a guest with us today. Introduce yourself, Christian. My name is Christian Swenson. I'm an adjunct professor at BYU and UVU. I teach comparative literature at BYU and philosophy at UVU. I am also, by day anyway, a sixth grade teacher at a Waldorf charter school called Mountain Sunrise Academy. Today, we're going to be talking about The Nightmare Before Christmas, the classic 1993 animated movie about Halloween taking over Christmas for our end of the year finale, our Halloween Christmas special combined. But first, we're going to do our best book segment where we each recommend something that we're watching, reading or listening to. My recommendation today, I have two. The first one is a little more serious and the second one is a little more silly. My first recommendation is Here by Darlene Young. She is an LDS poet, and she is a wonderful person. But this is a great book to buy as a Christmas gift for the middle-aged mother in your life. She writes lots of good poems about regular, everyday experiences that you have as an LDS mother. She's got a couple of poems in here about taking her sons to shovel the snow on the widow's driveways and going on date nights with her husband. And there's one that's called Date Night is Takeout and Netflix, which is real, so real. She has poems in here about the temple, some scriptural poems. I got to read you the title of one of these, which is At Age 50, She Buys Pink Roller Skates, which is exactly what you think it is. Mormon Mom Midlife Crisis. So... It's a really relatable, even if you aren't sure that poetry is for you, this poetry is for the middle-aged Latter-day Saint mother in your life, and I highly recommend you buy it for Christmas. My second recommendation is a short little silly Christmas movie that just came out this year that we watched for movie night today, and it was hilarious. It's called A Merry Little Batman, and it is on Amazon Prime. It is about Batman. When he finds out that he's going to be a dad, he cleans up all the crime in Gotham to make the city safe for his son. And so he's retired. And now his son is seven years old and wants to be Batman with his dad, but his dad thinks he's too young. Anyway, it ends up being a mashup of Batman and Home Alone. And it's fantastic and funny. A couple of crude jokes in there, but generally just a really enjoyable and silly holiday movie for the kid who loves Home Alone and Marvel movies. So that's A Merry Little Batman on Amazon Prime. Carl, what have you got for us today? Okay, point of order. Batman is DC, not Marvel, but we'll Uh we'll forgive you. I I know, but if your kid likes Marvel movies and also Home Alone, because nobody likes DC movies. (laughs) Yeah, if your kid is old enough to really get into Home Alone because they identify with Kevin, they're probably not old enough to get into the fight between Marvel and DC, but I digress. I also have two recommendations. We've been doing this podcast long enough now that I can recommend the fourth season of For All Mankind, having previously recommended the third season. But also, just, I discovered, now that I have Apple TV Plus for a couple of months while I'm watching the show, there's a lot of great science fiction on Apple TV Plus. Monarch Legacy of Monsters, for those of you who are into Godzilla and Kong and all that sort of stuff. Invasion, if you're into alien uh, invasion sort of stuff. Silo, if you're into very interesting post-apocalyptic character studies of people trapped in an underground bunker for generations. There's a lot of good stuff on Apple TV+, and I so far recommend all of them. There's just a lot of good stuff there. And my second thing, we were watching Wheel of Time Season 2, and I kept talking about how this was a little different than the books or that was a little different than the books. And and Susan eventually said, stop talking about this because I think I'm going to read the books. And then she started checking her off the library and I discovered about a week and a half ago that she's in book four. And I was like, okay, it's time. It's time. I stopped reading them in high school because the little blurb at the back would say, Robert Jordan intends to continue writing until they nail his coffin shut. 
And I called it in high school. I'm like, he's not going to finish this before he dies. I'm not going to invest anymore until I know the series is complete. And he died. And then, of course, Brandon Sanderson picked it up, but I never picked the books back up. I know the blurb now says he began writing in 1977 and continued until his death on September 16th, 2007. Again, I called it, but I have picked up book nine of the Wheel of Time and I am going to finally break down and finish this thing that I started in high school and that I really enjoyed, but I just wasn't really willing to commit until I knew it had its full run, which is also something I do with a lot of TV shows. And it's the Wheel of Time. It's back on the menu, boys, at least for Carl and Susan. She's inspired me to get back into it. So here we are. All of Apple TV Plus is science fiction and The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan slash Brandon Sanderson. That'll certainly be enough to keep you busy over Christmas break. (laughs) Right? What do you have to recommend to us, Christian? A weird book, but it's also science fiction. It's my, my favorite science fiction author ever. His name's Philip K. Dick. He's the one that wrote Man of the High Castle. He wrote a lot of books, Flow My Tears, The Policeman Said. One of my favorites is The Maze of Death, but this one I'm rereading right now is called Volus. It's an autobiographical book by him that's a mix of fiction and science fiction and nonfiction, both of them. It's hard to explain. It imagines that what kind of is built around a mystical experience he had. It's a weird mystical experience, but it's really cool. He reported that a beam of pink light, of all things, entered his eyes, entered his mind, and filled him full of information. And this is actually a historical fact that he had an intuition that his son had a specific organ disorder that he knew was the case. And then he went to a doctor and they confirmed it exactly. He attributed it to this mystical experience he had. But in any case, he writes this book built around it. And it's really cool because there's a lot of metafiction stuff happening. At the beginning, there's two people. You can't really tell which one's Philip K. Dick and which one's not. And turns out towards the end, spoiler alert, that they're actually the same person, but they've been psychotically split. And that there's some kind of union that happens near the end. It's really cool. There's a lot of theology in the book. There's a lot of science fiction in the book. There's a lot of psychology in the book. It's a tour de force of what Philip K. Dick can do, and he can do a lot. So I'll say that. That is fascinating. I've read a few of his, but I have not even heard of that one. So I am going to have to look that one up after the show. That's fascinating. That sounds really interesting to me. Yeah. So we'll have links to all of these recommendations on our website, popcultureapricottree.com. And buying through those links helps support our podcast so we can keep bringing you conversations about the true and the beautiful in pop culture. And now we'll go on to our main discussion of The Nightmare Before Christmas. I have a confession to make at the beginning of this episode that I personally never saw this film as a kid. For some reason. I interpreted the aesthetic style of the film as being dark or scary, which meant in my mind it was a bad film. And so I avoided it. And fast forward to when I got married, my husband was like, what? You haven't seen this movie. This is my entire personality. So he showed it to me and I felt really sad that I had missed out on it all these years. It really is my husband's favorite film. He does not like musicals or Christmas films, but he loves this one. And I'm not sure why I feel the need to say this, except for that maybe there are others out there with similar experiences who also missed out on something great as a child and now feel like they need to give it a chance. What's your guys' experience or history with the film, Carl? How about you? I honestly don't remember the first time that I watched it, but I'm pretty sure I did not see it in 1993 when it first came out. This was something I discovered a little later on in life. Maybe not as late as you did, it sounds, but late enough that it wouldn't have captured any sort of childlike wonder. But I remember just watching it and going, this is delightful. I love the just the idea of the holidays kicking each other over and the competing worldviews. And I find Jack Skellington a really interesting character. Just someone who is so good at something, but who does it for so long, he gets bored and wants to try something new. Who doesn't resonate with something like that? And I just found the whole thing delightful. Claymation, Tim Burton, Danny Elfman. What's not to like about this movie, even though it's just an utterly bizarre movie that I feel was like maybe The Princess Bride, where at its inception, it didn't get a lot of attention. But as it has aged very well, and it's finding more and more people who enjoy this, it became a, a holiday classic. And I say holiday because, of course, do you watch this for Halloween or for Christmas? And the answer, of course, is yes. 
uh, you can watch it for anything from October 1st all the way through January 1st, in my opinion. It's just a great movie. Watched it with my kids, and they had a delightful time. It's not too scary for them. I have a seven and a five-year-old. And I'm a two-year-old who probably doesn't care about such things yet, but they had a fun time and they really enjoyed watching it and made great comments about what it would be like for Halloween to take over Christmas and why that's a really bad idea. It's just a delightful movie. And every, every time I revisit it, it's fantastic. I even have some friends whose Christmas wreath is literally the, the snake Ouroboros thing from the movie that they hang up on their door every year. And I'm like, oh, I want that. That's amazing. It's great. Christian, tell us your initial thoughts about the film or your history with the film. Oh, I have all the history with the film. The film goes back to where I come back from. I was born in the same year the film came out. And I encountered it, actually, when I was a little kid. And it was the film I watched over and over and over. That was that film. I think I was trying to process something, trying to understand something. So I was trying to watch it, like, deep, deep into what I was sensing. My sense of what I was sensing is something like transcendence. The film is about what transcends you, I think. It's about how we relate to what's beyond us and how we deal with the fact that sometimes our limitations won't let us appropriate. I think that's a universal human struggle. It's a human struggle that is not just universal, but is deeply painful. It could also be deeply liberating if you come to terms with it. I think that's what Jack Skellington does, is he longs for something he's not. He encounters it, but then he tries to appropriate it. He tries to, in some sense, transactionalize something that's given to him as a gift. That's what Christmas is. It's a gift. And he tries to make it mine. I'm going to make it mine. This year, Christmas will be ours. And Christmas doesn't work that way. Gifts don't work that way. Those are my thoughts initially. I love it. Yeah. We found each other because you'd written an article about this on an old blog from the Mm -hmm. Blogger Knackle days. But I just love this idea of trying to control something that cannot be controlled. And I feel like that's a feeling that exists in our world a lot nowadays of we all are trying to like manage other people's reactions to us and no, you need to interact with me in the way that I want or I need to control the world to be exactly the way I want and then things will be great and not accepting that there's an other out there that's not the same as us and experiencing it but not controlling it. So I, I felt that when I was reading your piece. Which we will link in the show notes, of course. I'm good. This is the thing that I find just so compelling about his character is the whole song, What Is This? I feel like he is having a genuinely almost, I'm going to say, religious experience when he encounters Christmas Town. And he's like, this hole in my heart. I did not realize, I mean, I knew something was wrong, but I had no idea there was this other thing out there that could absolutely fill it. This is wonderful. It feels very St. Augustine to me. Lord, our souls do not rest until they rest in you sort of thing. It's just having this great experience. And, and then when he comes back and tries to explain it to the denizens of Halloween Town, they, of course, have no frame of reference whatsoever. He's trying to give them this one. So we have this guy who's had this religious experience. He's not trying to convert other people. And just not working because they're in such a different mindset and it's such just a, a different way of viewing the world and what they feel their purpose is. And it's so fun to see him and then to have it by the end of the movie turn around. My two favorite songs are What Is This? And then Jack's Lament at the end when he is like, what have I done? I've taken this thing. I've absolutely ruined it. But then when he realizes I can save Christmas, I'm going to go get Sandy Claus back. But when he stands up and says, that's right, I am the Pumpkin King. (laughs) He's been rejuvenated within himself because of his interaction with this other thing, this ineffable experience that he doesn't have the vocabulary for. His attempts to glom onto it are just laughably, hilariously incorrect and wrong. But it has rekindled within himself something that is great and wonderful and that we need, because we need the Skeleton King. And trying to be Santa Claus helps him be the best Skeleton King he can. And next Halloween's going to be terrifying. And that's great. I find that such a fun character arc to go from the despondency to doing the exact same thing, but being really excited about it because of this interaction with the Christmas Town stuff that I just find delightful. He's having a religious conversion, but it makes him better. 
And that's something I would hope we could all get behind when we encounter a different faith or encounter God in a different way or read the scriptures anew or whatever it is that rekindles in you the spark that you used to have, because we all lose it every once in a while, whatever the spark is, and it can be renewed in us and sometimes in ways we don't expect. And I think Discovery Christmas Town, he did not expect that, but in the end, it works out really well for everybody, except for maybe the humans for the first half of Christmas night, but whatever. It's about expectation, isn't it? He does not expect what he finds in Christmas Town, but he kind of plasters bit by bit the expectations he's culturally built up on top of it. He tries to piece together what this thing is based on what he already understands. And he defaces the transcendent by almost trying to defend himself against that feeling of what's this. He tries to answer the question too soon. I think that's a big temptation we could have as religious people and as people oriented towards the transcendent is to try to reduce it to our categories, try to reduce the mystery to something we already understand. And mystery is so important, I think, because otherwise it's idolatry. There's nothing that transcends you. There's nothing more. There's just that it says in the Book of Mormon, I think, right? Woe unto those who say we have enough. In other words, woe unto those who reject the transcendent. Woe unto those who reject mystery. Mystery is the key, I think. And Jack Skeleton is at first awed by mystery, but is then overwhelmed by it to such a degree that he tries to reduce it. And I think that's the universal experience of encountering something new, right? You encounter something new and then you stop seeing it as something new because you're used to it. And I guess the question we could ask is, how do we as human beings orient ourselves to what's beyond us without reducing it to us? Yeah, that's super interesting. I love it. I like thinking about Jack Skellington's experience with Christmas as a conversion or an experience with God. And then he brings it back and he's trying to perform it. I think that's a good word for it. He's trying to perform Christmas, but he doesn't really understand it. It's a cargo cult. I don't know if you guys know what a cargo cult is, right? I have no idea. Okay, sorry. This is really Explain. Quick. A cargo cult. When in World War II, we set up all these military bases, these sort of air force bases on these various Pacific islands. And so there could be like landing strips and we can have re- fueling depots and just stuff like that. And then we won World War II and we left. But we left like all our stuff behind because we didn't pack it all up necessarily. And later on, people would come back to these islands and discover that the natives, the inhabitants would watch all of these U.S. servicemen come. They were like building bamboo huts and building little bamboo radio towers and little stick radios. And they would talk into the mics as if they were communicating with something. And the, the anthropologists, the people who came to study this really weird thing, why are they setting up these wicker U.S. army bases on these Pacific islands? They discovered that these people saw that the U.S. military servicemen would do these things and then planes would appear and bring them foods and supplies. And so these Pacific Islanders, these natives, were trying to recreate the Rajic ritual so that the planes would come and bring them food. I'm oversimplifying a lot of stuff here, but they were just basically going through the motions with having no idea of what it actually is. What is a radio? How does that work? They have no idea. It's not part of their experience. So they see these Americans doing this amazing, miraculous things. And then they just try to reproduce the spell or whatever moniker you want to put on it to get the same result. The term is cargo cult because there are these people who have recreated the cults because they want the cargo. You can go look it up on Wikipedia. And so that's what Jack Skellington is. He doesn't really understand it, but he's going to try to go through the motions to try to recreate the magic. And like the cargo cult people, it doesn't work. Oh, that's interesting. Where I was going with this is when he's doing that is when he's least himself. He's trying to imitate something and be something he's not because it gave him this feeling this one time. And then at the end, when he finally understands Christmas, he becomes more himself again, right? He's enthusiastic about himself. I am the pumpkin king, right? And he's all excited again about who he is. And it reminded me of a C.S. Lewis quote. So here we go. The more we let God take us over, the more truly ourselves we become because he made us, he invented us. He invented all different people that you and I were intended to be. And so it's when I turn to Christ and give up myself to his personality that I first begin to have a real personality of my own. And so there's sometimes this thought that 
if you are a good member of the church, we're all the same. And I love C.S. Lewis's concept that no, when you give yourself to Christ, you become more yourself than you were before if you're doing it right. Everybody becomes more themselves. And so we shouldn't all be Christmas. We, we need people who are Halloween or various other holidays. It, that's not the goal. The goal isn't to make everybody the same. So I think that's one reason that that moment at the end feels so triumphant is because he's realized that he needs to be himself and he becomes a better version of himself through this experience that he's had. But it's not expressive individualism where it's just, oh, me, mine, mine. I am the measure of all things. He has let this other thing change him. So he is a better version of himself, but because he now has something to juxtapose outside of himself, and so that is uh, a very useful tool and a message as well to encounter other things in your life so you can be the best version of you. When I was teaching in my class on Mormonism at Georgetown, I got in trouble a little bit for some of this with some of my academic peers who are like, why are you trying to do this with your class? That I explicitly had as one of the objectives of the class. I want you to be a better whatever you are, atheist. Muslim, most of them are Catholic because it's Georgetown. Because you've studied Mormonism, I want you to look at Mormonism and say, oh, I'm going to be a better Catholic now because of X or because I encountered Y idea or something to help these people along in their own lives. And the, the, I think the way Georgetown University would have their formation be, formation is a very Catholic word, um, which is fine at Georgetown because they're Catholic. Jesuit specifically, of course, but... I really um, think we could use that word more in Latter-day Saint culture. I think the idea of spiritual formation is something we should really talk about more. And you get a good dose of your ability to spiritually form yourself when you encounter the other, whether that be philosophically or whatever. And I think that's a great way to... That's why this is a great movie, because it shows that so well. Speaking of spiritual eclecticism, I love the word regeneration from Swedenborgianism. I would call myself a Swedenborgian Latter-day Saint, if you could call me anything. I'm really, really influenced and spiritually energized by those ideas. For those who don't know, Emanuel Swedenborg was an 18th century Swedish Christian mystic who, first of all, he was like Neil deGrasse Tyson. If he went on X tomorrow and tweeted that he had a religious experience, that's who he is. And then started writing books about his encounters with God and heaven and all that. That's him. And he had a posthumously estimated IQ of like 205. He wrote like thousands, tens of thousands of page and pages in manuscript, all sorts of things. He was a genius. And then he started writing these books about his waking visions of heaven and hell and God and levels of heaven. And it's super resonant with Latter-day Saint theology in lots of ways. Talks about three levels of heaven. The highest one is called the celestial. In his own way, he talks about the, 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 the human form of the divine. And he talks about marriage in heaven, of all things. But one of the things he talks about is this idea that you were alluding to, that the closer to God we get, the more we lose ourselves in God, the more God gives us a self. And the more we try to cling to ourselves, the more we lose a self. It, it's paradoxical. It's almost Zen Buddhist. The more you lose yourself, the more the breath comes back. This is the idea of like self-emptying, kenosis, I suppose you could say, some version of it. But anyway, his idea of regeneration really compels me because I think that's what this film's about. According to him, anyway, we start out self-centered. It's the natural man idea and that we're like a bone. That's the image he uses. And that's what really compels me about this film. We're like a bone. We're lifeless. We're dense. We're kind of dark, so to speak. And I think what that means is we try to control things. We think we're the center of the universe. But the more we open ourselves to the possibility that there is something transcendent, that there is something greater than us, the more the skeleton we are gets filled with, I suppose you could say, a heart of grace, of inflow. And I think that that's some really deep, probably unconscious symbolism in the film because he is a skeleton. He's empty. Like you said, he has a hole in his heart. He doesn't even have a heart. He's empty. There's a big hole in his chest. And he talks about that in the song. There's something missing. And of course he's, there's something missing. He's a skeleton. That's how skeletons work. It's the contrast between Jack Skeleton and Santa Claus, who is very fleshy, let's say. And there's the idea that there's a contrast between the two, right? <laughs> this is full of life. He's full of death. Then it's talking about the right relationship, I think, of death and emptiness to life and fullness. I think that's some of the deep symbolism of the film. I think it's really interesting that you point out that we start out very self-centered. And Jack does start out with that self-centeredness, like, I'm not feeling fulfilled. I need to do something for me. 
And at the turning point in the film, he realizes that his actions have affected other people. And then by accepting that, that's when the change happens. And so that's what makes this not an expressive individualist film, even though he becomes more himself, right? Because he realizes my actions have affected others. And so I need to change my actions because those were bad effects on others. It's focused outside of the individual instead of just on, am I fulfilling myself? Joseph Smith famously said, well, true religion comes about by proving opposites. And it's the phrase from the Savior. He who would lose his life will find it. And he who would find his life loses it. That is something that is so paradoxical, but is still true nonetheless. It's just interesting to me that I don't, I of course don't think that Tim Burton and Danny Elfman and everybody involved really wanted this to be that religious of a movie. And you you can do like a, a lesser, a more secular version of it where just go on a vacation, try a new job for a little while, go volunteer, do something else to get back into your old routine and come back with it. Go camping for a week and then you come back, you're like, oh, indoor plumbing, it's great. Whatever it is, gets you out of yourself and back in. But this transcendent theme is, I think, for those of us who are religious, there's a lot more to mine here than just go volunteer somewhere else for a week or try something new. How do you find yourself is a question we all have to wrestle with. And in Jack Skellington's case, it's by touching something outside of himself and moving more in that direction, losing his life to find it. Eventually he tries to do the Christmas thing. He's losing his Halloween life, but then he comes back and he's like, oh no, I'm the pumpkin king. And I just can't wait till next Halloween because I've got some ideas that are really make him scream. I think that's one thing I also love about the film is he's really mastered kind of the sing songiness. I was reading on Wikipedia that like his three inspirations for this film are Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and the poem A Visit from St. Nicholas. And you can hear the poetry of Dr. Seuss. And that older poem going at some points in the film, like the dialogue is just very sing song -y. You can feel that throughout the film. And yet it works. It's so strange that it just, it works so well. I wonder if there's another common story we could relate it to. When I talk about this story with my college students, I say, this is just another version of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. This is exactly the same structure of a story, right? You have someone living in their town and goes to an alien foreign place something away from their culture, so to speak, and a place that is human, but not quite human. In other words, our culture, our way of looking at the world, our, our way of viewing the world is kind of, kind of that and kind of not over there. And she goes there and she looks like Jack Skellington does. At, oh, I think I know what this is. But because I think I know what this is, I'm going to use it in the way I think I know how to do it. And then she breaks. It. She makes herself too at home too quickly because she's projecting what she thinks she knows onto what she ultimately doesn't know. And I think it, that story is really a warning about ultimately appropriation in multiple forms based on uh, a premature understanding of what is other. It warns us against subsuming the other too quickly under the head of what we already understand. So I think you'd read this culturally too. I think this is ultimately a story about appropriation of the transcendent in terms of religion and God, but it could be a story about the appropriating the transcendent in terms of culture too. I think, yeah, you could read it that way. I think ultimately what's so great about Halloween Town is that it's idiosyncratic, unique, and ultimately a bit odd, like another culture will seem if you just entered it. And in that sense, it brings to the fore what cultural encounter is and how those dynamics can work and how scary that can be and, and maybe how we can relate better. I mean, this is a good sort of example to talk about for Latter-day Saint missionaries who are going out, like, especially for those who are going to a foreign culture. And I went to New York City from or Utah, which is relatively foreign, not as foreign as some other places, though, like my brother and my friends who went to, I don't know, Japan or, or Taiwan or whatever, just radically different cultures that you go to. And especially if you're going to evangelize, it might be good to just show up and certainly don't spend months just listening to the people you're there to teach. The Lord sends us to do that. He even says that the doctrine of covenants, I send you forth to teach or to preach, not to be preached to, but only bring maybe the pure gospel. Don't boil down various cultural assumptions and things. Spend some time listening and absorbing. And this is why Latter-day Saints as a whole have um, 
some, I think, interesting political views as a group on things about uh, immigration, uh, where we don't line up with Republican orthodoxy the way you would think we would, considering how many of us are Republicans. And I think that is because so many of us have served in foreign missions and learned just different ways of viewing the world. And I think that redounds to our benefit. But to go and, especially in this proselytic situation, be like, no, I've here, let me explain to you what's going on here. No, go and learn from these people and listen, and you will find yourself deeply enriched by that. And it's going to seem weird sometimes, and that's fine. It's our town, but we're not mean, right? This is reminding me of this year I'm teaching first year writing, and we had a reflection assignment at the end where the students were supposed to write about how the things they learned in first year writing they can apply to their next semester, or if they're going on a mission, how they would apply it to their mission. And it was really interesting to read the students who are going on missions right after this semester, thinking about how do you apply rhetorical skills to your mission? And we emphasized a lot being open to people who think differently than you and peacemaking and not saying you're wrong and here's the right way and let me show you how, but oh, let me understand where you're coming from and then let me see if we can find some common ground and talk. And applying that concept to a mission, I was just super impressed by several of my students who were like, yeah, I realized that I need to use this when I'm proselyting on a mission because I can't start from nowhere and just say, here's the gospel. You're wrong. I need to understand where these people are coming from and find something that, that is important to them that we can share, that we can build off of to this is how I see it. Here's some things that might help you with that problem you have or with this idea that you really value. Here's what I also think about that idea. And this idea of finding common ground even across cultures, across people who think differently from each other is so important to sharing the gospel, I think. It feels really forced and awkward if we just go in there with, here's our version of Christmas. Do you want it? Instead of trying to really understand first and then work on it. Life's no fun without a good scare. That's our job, but we're not mean in our town of Halloween. That's the line. There you go. When you're looking, you're like, why would you just want to scare people? They're like, look, we're not mean. That's our job. This is what we do. And that's a, a necessary part of the holiday sequence. But I'd love to see if, I don't know, there isn't going to be a sequel, of course, but to see them interacting with Thanksgiving or Easter or something. Well, Easter Bunny has a small Okay, cameo. okay, let's talk about sequels, though, because I found out that they did release a sequel novel recently. One of my sixth graders is reading. Tell me more. Okay. Do you know anything about it? I didn't write down everything about it. It's about Sally. It's called Long Live the Pumpkin Queen. And apparently you find out all about Sally's secret backstory that she wasn't made by the mad scientist guy and her what? learning to... Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> But apparently Tim Burton's been really protective of not doing a sequel to it. And only in these last few years have there started being that there's this novel and there's also a sequence of graphic novels that are about zero. Maybe there's another, a pre, another prequel novel coming out soon. So I'm wondering with, with, with the current Disney attitude, is it only a matter of time before pretty soon we might be getting a sequel? Oh, I don't know if I like that. Sometimes you don't mess with a perfect thing. Right. I don't want there to be a remake of Firefly. It ended. It's fine. I wish I lived in a timeline where it got all 10 seasons, but we don't. And now we have the movie and we don't mess with it anymore. There's a PlayStation 2 video game of it from like a number of years ago as well called Nightmare Before Christmas, Oggy's Revenge of all things. So there you go. I, I don't think I'm going to call that canon. One of the great things about this film, and I think one of the central ideas in it is liminality is it's about the threshold between different states, between different places, between lots of different things. The central image in the film is a door. So it's about a threshold, literally, between one world and another. Yeah, I think that's just the coolest concept that they brought up in this movie. And that's like what everybody wants to do a sequel with, is that Absolutely. wood between and, and, the you know, holidays. That's kind of, that's what a forest is. A forest lives between things. And when you get into this little circle, you realize, you're in the place between places. You have encountered the place where encounter happened. You've gone to the place where you're between systems. If there's a transcendent, if there's a place where transcendent happened, it's here, right? 
that makes me wonder if he should have just met Santa Claus coming through the door instead of going into his place or something like that. I don't know. But in any case, I think this film seems to be about how to navigate liminality, that place of going between places. You want more on that? You can faith crisis. Episode that's on faith crises right. or something like where you switch between seeing if one worldview and the next, which I got to be honest is probably my favorite of all of the episodes we've done so far. I love that idea that the the place where you switch between the one, I don't want to call it a worldview to the next, or where you're leaving one system and going to another. That's where in that moment of change is where. That's where you have to make decisions about how are you going to approach it? Am I going to just go to observe? Am I going to go to proselytize? Am I going to go in an interface uh, setting? Those three are the sort of obvious ways of approaching something new. There are gradations between them, but how you approach a new experience is very different if you're showing up to proselytize or just observe. Or maybe to do interfaith work, which would have, I think, led to a better outcome in this situation. Explain to me why Christmas is better, Santa Claus, Sandy Claus, right? What What are you doing here? What are you trying to accomplish? And then Santa Claus would be like, Jack Skellington, why do you scare people at Halloween? What's the point of that? And they would have had an a interesting, good conversation. They seem to come to some sort of appreciation for each other by the end. Santa Claus is wishing everybody a, a Merry Christmas and a, or a Happy Halloween. And Jack Skellington's wishing him a Merry Christmas as he makes it snow. And then all the denizens of Halloween Town say, what is this? They repeat the song, but it's because they're finally getting a glimpse of the Christmas magic that Jack encountered when he actually went through the entire door and went there bodily himself to a new location. Santa Claus is just bringing just the barest hint, just a little bit of snow to Halloween Town, and it changes all of them. And yeah, there's a couple of moments where they switch back and forth. So that end where Santa's flying through the sky over Halloween Town is a moment where the two have blended and it's great. They're doing some good. I'm using the term interfaith here. I don't know if that's the right term, but I hope you get what I'm going for. Interholiday work. Interholiday work, right? Sure. I, w- I would call it dialogue. That's the first moment where Dandy Claus or whatever he's called in this film says, Merry Christmas to Jack Skellington. And he responds, Happy Halloween. That's, I think that's the first time there's real dialogue in the show. The film is about the absence of dialogue, too. This, Like you said, it could have gone a lot better if they'd had a conversation. And there's not conversation. There's just mutual misunderstanding. And I think that's a lesson for many of us, if not all of us. I think that's the lesson of social media, right? Is that we are trapped within our own bubbles. We're trapped within our own worlds and worldviews like the film. And we understand other worlds and worldviews only in terms of our own. Because... Some of the structures of the algorithm basically prevents dialogue. It's designed to be that way, I think. And it creates by its nature and almost by design, misunderstanding and and conflict, really. Definitely by design for conflict. That's for sure. I read somewhere that Facebook's algorithm, maybe it's changed since I read this article a couple of years ago, but the hate emoji, right? The hate reaction they weighted that more for engagement. Like they wanted that more than the love or the just the like emoji or whatever. They found it was better. They got more clicks. More people would be interested. They had more fights, more interactions with each other on Facebook. If they could prioritize the stuff that they knew was going to get the anger reaction. This is deeply unhealthy, you guys. Just be aware of it. What does it say about us as people that we interact more when we're mad with someone than we do when we love someone or are comforting them? Not a a good statement about us as a society, but I think it's definitely been exacerbated by the algorithms, which we have to fight against. And it's playing life on hard mode. I think it's just human nature. And that's part of why I think Jack Skellington's arc is a useful one to study. I know this is just a silly, fun holiday movie, but I'm glad we've taken it in this more serious direction because in order to fight against these forces that are trying to get us, which exist in ourselves, I think. I don't think this is just Facebook being Facebook. I think they are exploiting a part of human nature. But in order to fight against these forces within ourselves and without, one of the things is to do genuine dialogue. And you have to figure out a way to find someone with whom you disagree with 
whose worldview was completely alien and foreign to you, like Christmas Town and Halloween Town. And you have to figure out how to get along with these people and appreciate what goodness they bring and try to incorporate it as much as possible into your life and help them appreciate the goodness that you bring so they can incorporate it into theirs. Now, I don't know if Santa Claus is going to start giving out horror-themed toys next year. Probably not. But I kind of wonder if he and Jack, if they ever did get together, what would their conversations be about? That would just be deeply fascinating to me. Now they've come to appreciate each other. In my college classes at, at UVU, I teach ethics and values. It's, one, it's what every student there has to take. And in my very of the course, I have the students write over the course of the semester, three ideological Turing tests. You heard of the Turing test, right? An artificial intelligence basically tries to simulate human consciousness by acting like it. So in this assignment, I have a student simulate an opinion they don't agree with by pretending, by arguing for it convincing. And it's meant to build empathy. It's meant to help them argue better. It's meant to open their perspective. It's help, It's meant to make them less afraid, honestly, because we're less afraid of something when we understand it well. And I think that in many cases, that's what you're talking about, right? And that's what kind of what the film is about, is that it's trying to understand something in different ways, so to speak. And another thing that really captivates me about this film is that he puts on the suit. He puts on Santa's suit, right? It's almost like he is trying to control by becoming, right? And I think going back to the religious aspect of it, we could say that's a real danger religiously is if we're making this equation of Santa Claus with God, then the danger is by trying to worship, making yourself into God, turning worship into self-worship. That is a universal problem in religion and the attempt to better oneself is to turn the attempt to better oneself into self-aggrandizement. And that's, that can be dangerous, both in terms of making myself, I'm so great, but also I'm so awful. In both cases, it's about you. You're God. And unless you turn that towards, again, the other, right, there's, you're missing the point. Um, Adam S. Miller, the, the Latter-day Saint theologian, talks in his book, his poorly aged titled book, Letter to a Young Mormon. He talks about how he defines sin as stories. What he means by that is you turn the project of religion into something you're telling about yourself, something about yourself, when religion is meant to open you up to serve others and to learn from others and to participate and communicate and commune with others or in a communion, in a greater body. But to the extent we try to become the whole, to the extent we try to become God, to put on the Santa suit, we're eclipsing God. We're stopping the flow. We are preventing grace. We're rejecting grace by trying to think we're the ones who gives grace in the first place. And that's what this film is about too. It's about grace. It's about how you respond to grace and how you shouldn't respond to grace. Because like at that end scene in the film, grace comes from above. It's a snow falling down. It is received. It can't be captured. It can't be appropriated. It can't be manipulated. It has to be received, again, Christmas term, as a gift. And otherwise, that is literally hell, is when we reject God. Just reminds me of Eustace when he turns into the dragon in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. There's only so much he can do to save himself. Aslan has to come and claw away all the dragon stuff to get back to the boy underneath. It's not something he can achieve by himself. When you turn it completely self-reflexively, oh, I'm just going to live my life. I'm not going to follow the commandments. I know better than God. Nobody really says it that, that explicitly, but it's a problem we all have. Doctrine and Covenants section one has this really poignant phrase that I just love, where it says, every man walks after the image of their own God. But you're right, by putting on the Santa suit, he's like, I'm going to be Santa. I'm going to do this thing. It's going to be great. And there's just a selfishness there to be like, this is going to be great for me. I'm going to feel better. By being Santa, I'm going to ruin Christmas because I'm doing a really weird form of self-therapy to try to appropriate this thing and fix myself by becoming something I'm not. And that's not how religion works at all. I'm just reminded a little bit of, it's a very dense book. I'm not necessarily recommending it to everybody, but An Interpretation of Religion by John Hick. I don't know if you've uh, seen or read that one, Christian. Just about the idea that, that there's this transcendent thing, and then everybody just basically interprets it according to their own particular 
religious viewpoint or field. And so the same transcendent thing is what gets us Christianity and Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism and all these things. It's all the same thing. We just, our human attempts to understand it become these different religions. And I have some serious issues with that sort of thing, even though I do partially agree with John Hick in that I do believe that God is beyond our understanding, that there are things that no matter how much we try, we can't put in a box. We can't make it. It's like the phrase, right? Don't try to completely put Plato into your head because you're just going to constrain Plato and give yourself a headache. And that's even more true with our spirits and with God. Don't try to put God all in you because that's just going to, that you're constraining God and it's just going to give you a headache, so to speak. Um, And we have to let it be its own thing and touch us. And that's an ongoing dialogue. And that's why I think the end of the movie is so poignant, like you point out, where they do have a moment of genuine dialogue. Happy Halloween, Merry Christmas, where for the first time, they're not trying to appropriate Christmas. They're just going to let Christmas be Christmas. So I found a great lyric in the film that speaks exactly to what we're talking about. It's near the end of the song, what's it called? Jack's Obsession. And this is the point where he starts to lose the mystery. I think this is the point where he's lost the mystery. He says, I think this Christmas thing is not as tricky as it seems. And why should they have all the fun? It's a step-by-step thing. It should belong to anyone, not anyone, in fact, but me. I could make a Christmas tree. And there's no reason I could find I couldn't handle Christmas time. I bet I could improve it too. And that's exactly what I'll do. And then it goes on to say, this year, Christmas will be ours. In other words, he, he means mine. That's what he means. And that's the real danger. That I think is, to me, anyway, this is the root of all sin, is appropriate. In Swedenborg, who I mentioned earlier, in the Latin word for his basic, the ego or the natural man is the proprium, which is the same root as appropriate. It's to make the transcendent mine. Yeah, and... So I think this film has a lot to say about very important things that speak deeply to the human heart. What are some thoughts we have on how we can avoid the trap of appropriation? Because the movie doesn't really get into this so much. What is the change in Jack when he's there in the graveyard, having been shot down by the army and Jack's lament? What can we do? Maybe it's a lesson from the movie. Maybe it's just a part of our conversation. To avoid the trap of appropriation, which is a natural human thing, we all want to put these cool things we encounter through the lens of what we already know and understand. How can we avoid that in our own lives? And yet still in the case of us all being members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, again, back to Dr. Covenants 1, and really believing that we are the only true and living church on the face of the whole earth. This is a hard line for us Latter-day Saints to walk, to have holy envy for other traditions, to learn things from them, and yet still believe that, that we're it in the long run, in, in, in the end. Um, I don't know. Any, any thoughts on how we can avoid the sin of appropriation and yet not wholly give over to the sin of, I don't know, what's, I don't know what's the opposite? Imposition, maybe, would be the opposite of... I think this is really interesting because I think there's a kind of universalism you could distill from Latter-day Saint theology. If you looked at it really carefully, there's a line in the Journal of Discourses, I forget who said it, it's a very early apostle in Utah, who said something like that. I was about to say that I'm not a universalist, but I am. I'm also a Presbyterian, I'm a Methodist, I'm a whatever, and I'm a whatever. And the difference between us and them is that they damn each other. We don't damn anyone, so to speak. And the idea is that by embracing and accepting all truth, that's what makes us the only true truth, in a sense is that we refuse to damn the other. I think that attitude is really healthy. I think it needs to be remembered more. And I guess it is a kind of appropriation, but it's also a deep kind of respect and a deep kind of openness to, again, mystery. Again, the idea that woe unto those who say we have enough. We don't have enough. We will never have enough. There will always be progression. There will always be learning. There will always be more. There is so much more everywhere, always. And to reject that, I think, is a primal sin. I really think so. And I deeply admire the eclect that is deeply bound in with many strands of Latter-day Saint culture. I think you see it in all sorts of places. One of the places you see it is like you talked about, 
I teach at BYU occasionally. One of the things when I teach at BYU is I ask people, raise your hand if you know another language. And most of the students will raise their hand. That's highly unusual. How, like 18 and 19 and 20 and 21 year olds, most of them being multicultural in, at least in that way. It's incredible. And there's this film, you probably heard of it, Sons of Provo. It's a solar film. And, but there's this idea in it, poking fun at Mormons can be Buddhists too. That's a thread in Latter-day Saint culture, this kind of openness to eclecticism. And I think it's because many of us know that we're weird and we can sympathize with the weird. I think that's an advantage we have. I think a deeply healthy and helpful attitude towards Latter-day Saint theology would be to say that our truth comes not just from the doctrine, but from the fullness of doctrine. It comes from our openness to all truth everywhere and always. I think Brigham Young is what it says, or maybe it was Joseph Smith. Now I, now I go look it up. And Mormonism is to gather all truth. In, I'm pretty sure it's Brigham Young. We will gather truth in from all the corners of the earth and bring it together and make it one, one great whole. I think that this is not a practice that can be intellectualized. I think it's something that has to be practiced in real life. And I think that's one of our advantages of as Latter-day Saints is that we're a religion that is very orthopraxic. We believe in doing stuff as much or probably more than just believing stuff. And as we practice and interact with people in the world, as we go on missions, as people move into our wards and are different than us, that's how we learn over time and we make mistakes with each other and we offend each other. And we apologize for that and we fix it and we try to stumble our way towards Zion. You're going to always be bouncing between these things and we're going to overstep and we're going to have to apologize to each other. And that's part of the gospel, I think. And it, another piece of it is being careful not to make it the gospel and something else. Oh, I believe in the gospel and prepping or I believe in the gospel and Oh, I'm gonna steal this one from the screw tape letter spelling reform. Because screw tape puts that <laughs> in a long list of Christianity and this. But w there's a tendency wherever you are in the church, any group that you're in, to yeah, we all have this thing in common, but I believe this and I think this thing over here is really important. Oh, I'm a Latter-day Saint and I believe in biblical criticism, or I'm a Latter-day Saint and I believe in also this, and making the gospel more than and recognizing that all of these hobbies that we have on the side and in our interests that are really important to us, that's not the core. And getting back every once in a while to realize, okay, the core is actually this. And so I need to let go of the fact that everybody in my ward won't accept that they need to read the poetry and the Bible as poetry. And if they would all learn poetry, then they would understand the Bible better. Let that go. And let's focus on the gospel and similar things like that. Yeah, I'm a Latter-day Saint. I, mean, I like to talk about the religious themes in pop culture, right? I found both. I, there are quotes from both Brigham Young and Joseph Smith. I was mixing a couple of different memories in my head. Mormonism, so-called, embraces every principle pertaining to life and salvation for time and eternity, no matter who has it. If the infidel has got truth, it belongs to Mormonism. That's, that's Brigham Young. I want to say to my friends, we believe in all good. If you can find a truth in heaven, earth, or hell, it belongs to our doctrine. We believe it. We claim it. And then Joseph Smith said, we should gather all the good and true principles in the world and treasure them up, or we shall not come out to true Mormons. And so this is a theme of our church and has been from the very beginning but we want to gather up all truth from these different sources and kind of go out and look for it, guys. It's out there. It's not all just here in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As much as I believe, section one, talking about us being the only true and living church, there's a lot more out there and the universe of, of God's truth is vast and amazing and cool and fun and we should go look for it, even in Halloween Town. All right, let's wrap up now. We do three ratings for every movie that we talk about. Our first rating is a rating for content in terms of clean versus objectionable material. And we rate that on a scale from, of celestial, terrestrial, celestial, outer darkness. Like Carl said, for a Halloween-themed film, there's not a lot of scary stuff. I feel like that opening song is the scariest one. This is Halloween song. Some of the stuff in there is a little bit scarier than the rest of the film. I am the one hiding under your bed. The, the clown with the tearaway face, I have to say. Terrifying. But generally, I'd say probably Celestial. Yeah, I think I'd give it a low Celestial, the lowest of the three degrees of glory is Celestial. It's our job, but we're not mean in our town of Halloween, right? That's just the good thesis statement for all of these scary things in Halloween town. You just gotta recognize that 
this is this is what they do, man. But yeah, I think you're right. The first song is, is as scary as it gets. You get through the first 10 minutes with your three-year-old and then they'll be fine. It's right. Absolutely. I think it's pretty celestial. I'm going to honor my five-year-old self and praise it till the cows come home in all sorts of ways, in all sorts of places and times. Yeah, celestial. Our second rating is for artistic merit, which we do on a scale of one to five popcorn balls. This film is celebrating its 30th anniversary. How does the animation hold up, guys? Five Christian's popcorn balls. giving us balls. a thumbs up. Five popcorn balls, says Carl. Five, I have, I have two, though. How do you translate two thumbs into popcorn balls? That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> two thumbs for five popcorn balls. That's the rate. The music is amazing. I love Danny Elfman does the singing for Jack Skellington. And we haven't really talked about any of the other characters, but I love the mayor of Halloween Town. Some great political commentary in his throwaway lines. I can't do anything myself. I'm just an elected official. <laughs> right. The fact that he's so obviously two-faced, literally two-faced. Yeah. The trick-or-treaters and their, their song, Killing Up the Sandy Claws. Just, there's just so much fun in this movie that is just delightful and hilarious and makes you think a little bit. I enjoy all the Halloween Town stuff because it's so delightful to be like, if they were real Halloween Town people and they were nice, what would they be like? And it turns out they'd be really fun. I don't know. I just, the whole thing is, is just great. Yeah. I think the mayor is just a stream. Sally is, is fun, right? My daughter's, oh, is she the queen of, of Halloween? And I'm like, not yet. And she is by the end. But yeah, all the characters are just fun and interesting and great. And that speaks to the writing, the stop motion, claymation animation. We don't get a lot of those anymore. I'm hoping there's going to be another Wallace and Gromit someday, but. It's just not something that happens very much. And it's, there's just some... Is that new Chicken Run film, Claymation? There's a new Chicken Run film? It's happening? There's a new Chicken Run film, Dawn of the Nugget. My week has been made. That's a... There you go. In this world of all this digital stuff, to see a physical little clay puppet that they had to move to make him walk on the little spinning wheel of gambling when Oogie Boogie's got the guns and he's shooting at him. It's just delightful to watch and entertaining and fun and in a cartoony way, but not in a hand-drawn or digitally done cartoony way. It's its own art form. Fun, all the popcorn balls. I just realized that we missed an opportunity to discuss Jack Skellington and Sally as like the eternal couple, the father and the mother. But we're not going to go there. That's a whole other podcast. So when it's resolved is when they're together. Okay. Anyway, Gospel Connections, this whole podcast is a testament that we should probably just go five apricots on this one. But any objections? Carl? You, yeah, <laughs> you know my policy that I don't give it five unless there's an explicit Christ-centered gospel connection. And there isn't Christmas one. is in it, right? That's true. It is. But are there any overtly religious... Like, is there anything Christ-centered in Christmas Town, and nothing is springing to mind? This is a very secularized version of Christmas that all the little Jewish kids could get behind and everything. And while there are some great lessons and morally edifying messages to be drawn out, I give it four apricots because I'm just a negative Nancy when it comes to that sort of thing. Fair enough. Christian, your thoughts on a scale of one to five apricots for this film? Oh, five apricots. This is a devotional film. It's an unintentionally devotional film. It was, I don't know, it wasn't inspired, but it's certainly devotional. Despite Tim Burton's nihilism and whatever. It was was unintentionally great. Christian, do you have anything you want to plug online or anywhere that our listeners can find you? Or are you just busy teaching? (laughs) I'm busy teaching. There's the blog that you found me on that I haven't updated for a long time. Not because I don't like it. It's just because, I don't know, got busy doing other things, like you said. Its original title was Journals of a Mormon Mystic. Started it in high school. And then it turned into a mystic in the Church of Jesus Christ, I think. And that's been my identity for a very long time. I think of myself as a mystic. As someone who tries to connect with God on a pre-verbal level. On a level that transcends the self. That transcends all of those things that long for that direct, intuitive, immediate contact. And so I just had articles there going back like 10 years. Some of them are really weird, 
place where I just develop my writing style and kind of experiment it. So go there at your own risk. I also have a YouTube channel. It's not about religion, but it's about autism, the autism spectrum, I'm not ashamed of it. And this whole YouTube channel is about my tips and tricks and insights about living on the spectrum. All right. We'll throw those up for people who would like to find those links. They'll be on the show notes. You can follow my writing and book reviews at lizbusby.com. And Carl, where can people find you? I'm on thread still at Carl Cranny, and I have to say it's been great to meet a Sueda Borgian Latter-day Saint. I consider myself a Taoist Latter-day Saint with the side of Theravada Buddhism. We're, we're all here. It's all good. Thanks for joining us this week, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode, share the podcast with a friend who enjoys good Christmas movies and good conversation. You can also subscribe to the podcast on the platform of your choice or on YouTube. We would love to hear your thoughts about this episode via email, social media, or on our website. It makes our day to hear from you. This episode marks the end of season two of our podcast. We're going to be taking a break for the holidays, but we'll be back in your podcast feed soon after that. This has been Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree, encouraging you to seek after everything virtuous, lovely, of good report, or praiseworthy. We'll see you next time. <laughs>